Hi everyone, this is Duncan from the podcast Under the Stairs. This particular video you're checking out just now has the archival recording attached to it. The archival recording is from our podography, I think that's the term that we use, um, and it will feature reviews of movies that fall under the 88 Films Italian Collection series. Now, the vast majority of reviews we've done over the last five years have been in audio format and published on our RSS feed for the podcast. We are transitioning over to give you access to all those reviews right here on YouTube under a playlist. Now, we're doing that because we're about to do our first video recording of E88 Films Italian collection release, that being Tentacles. So there's plenty of opportunity to delve into the back catalogue of the reviews here. And if you like what you hear, then please hit subscribe on the channel, leave your comments below, and uh, check out the rich catalogue of over 1,200 episodes we have on podcasts under the stairs on any podcatching device or Spotify that you use. So stick around, enjoy the episode, and I'll speak to you very soon. And welcome back. So you just heard the trailer, a rather uneventful trailer. It was basically the score uh, for The Perfume of the Lady in Black. Disc number 30 in the 88 Films Italian Collection series. So uh, let's see what it says on the 88 Films website. The blurb about this one says, Hardened Jallo fans have been screaming out for a British release of 1974's macabre masterpiece, The Perfume of of the Lady in Black. Long considered one of the genre's greatest achievements, this surreal and spooky exploration of beautiful Hitchcockian blonde and a breakdown into oddball visions of childhood and violence, not to mention a bloody body count that seems concurrent with her mysterious and malevolent mindscapes, is a truly unique spin on the long-running Italian terror trend. Helmed expertly by Francesco Barelli, who penned gruesome excesses of Umberto Lenzi's classic Man from Deep River, and highlighting a provocative performance from the legendary Mimsy Farmer of Four Flies and Grey Velvet Flame, The Perfume of the Lady in Black is an outrageous experiment in the giallo form that has rightfully gained recognition as a must-see horror classic. Thankfully, down to the hard work of the 88 films, Blu-ray audiences can now finally explore its lunatic landscapes in this remastered and restored HD 
presentation. The special features for this one is a high def presentation from the original film sourced from the original negative, uncompressed English audio, uncompressed Italian audio with subtitles, a theatrical trailer, Italian opening and closing credits, and the reversible sleeve. Um, it's region locked to region B, so if you're in America, you will have to um, import with a multi region player. So there we go. So very light, in fact, non-existent in the special features in this one. And, you know, part of me feels that at times, eight, eight films, I, I, I mention this from time to time, I, I feel that they're in such a rush to get titles out that sometimes they maybe don't hold back and try and see how much they can clamber from people that are still alive or people that even want to talk about it. You can, I'm fairly sure you could probably get a couple of guys that know quite a bit about this movie to sit down and do some sort of interview or whatnot, but they don't do that here. No audio commentaries or anything over the top of this one. It's just the movie as is. Um, I will also say that the audio subtitles for the English, if you have the English language on, don't really marry up all that well at all, but that's a commentary along a lot of these movies that the you know they sometimes don't quite match up with what the characters are saying however that being said though they're far more on point than a lot of titles i have seen in the past so yeah let's let's just get into this one because this one to me reeks of quite a lot of different things and has moments of pure greatness and other points of i uh, can huh uh, which i did like about two or three times during this viewing the kind of main throng of this movie is this kind of dreamlike and at times maybe leaning towards more hyper stylized version of a Jallo whilst not really existent in the world of a Jallo and maybe owing more to something along the lines of the work that uh, Polanski was doing. If you think of movies to an extent, well definitely in the realms of something like a Rosemary's Baby, but even going a little bit out with that into something like Repulsion, it exists in that kind of bubble. Uh, we follow our main character, who is a chemist played by Mimsy Farmer, and she has... Um, let's, let's put it this way, an infatuation with her work. She's heavily, heavily involved with her work. She has a boyfriend who's played by Maurizio Bonilagula, um, who is all about, hey, let's have fun, crazy chemist lady. Let's do stuff like play tennis. This guy wants to play tennis more than any man I've ever met who is dating someone as captivating as Mimsy Farmer. I'd be like, let's not play tennis. Instead, you can handle my balls. You know what I mean? Uh, but he's like very kind of pushy about this. When she doesn't want to do that, it causes tension with him. In fact, it causes tension quite a lot throughout this movie that their relationship is built on this weird sense of is she in love with him? Isn't she in love with him? Does she enjoy her work more? Um, what is this guy's intentions? And we follow um, kind of Mimsy Farmer who is kind of close to, she lives in a block where she's very close to all her neighbours, kind of once again thinking about something like Rosemary's Baby, that sort of idea of this block, weird things happening in there, but she is having specific flashbacks to potential trauma that happened in her past specifically um, as relates to something along the lines of this woman in black uh, black hair, wearing black clothes, who she sees in hallucinations where she's spraying perfume on herself. We find out that this appears to be her mother and she has visions of this little blonde girl child which you see as potentially being her. And when she lapses into these bouts of, of kind of fanciful um, memories or even memories that appear to be breaking the walls of her psyche down uh, when she goes into them, when she comes to, people have died in some weird, weird way. Um, and that's kind of really the, the kind of setup to this movie. Um, it's kind of, as the movie goes on, she's like more and more visited by these, these kind of ideas of specific events that have happened in the past and uh, 
as the story, but I don't want to give away too much, but it looks like she may be involved with something pretty horrible that happened in the past and has managed to repress it, but now the walls of that repression are crumbling and memories and impulses from the past may be making their way to the forefront. Um, it's a beautiful movie to look at. Like This is one of those uh, jally that you sit down and you just wish you lived in Italy. Um, I mean, the, the, the setting is, is, you know, like something right out of painting. It's that fucking gorgeous to look at. And 88 Films have landed a really good print for this one, actually. And it has strong performances. Mimsy Farmer is great um, in this one. And she doesn't uh, shy away from getting naked at the end. You see a bit of tittage and bush, um, which is very nice, very, very nice, if you understand what I'm saying. So that's cool. Um, and the movie's probably at its best when it is doing things um, in the world of the kind of the flashback sequences, I think are where it works really well. But there's just a whole lot of our walking about the place walking into art museums and walking into pottery shops and something maybe triggering a memory which takes a bit of time and that's that's where the, not frustration, but that's where the overall kind of confusion comes in is that the narrative isn't handled well to do with these kind of hallucinations. That it does take a long time. I mean, the movie's just shy of two hours and it takes a long time before you really get a grasp on what the movie's trying to do, and by then, it's powering towards the end, and a and an ending which doesn't really add up to the sum of the parts beforehand, and it doesn't really feel overly fitting or satisfactory. And it might sound like that would be a big put-down for me, but kind of came in on the realms of kind of enjoying the movie without out and out loving it. I understand that it holds a bit of a reputation. It's a movie I hadn't seen before and I was really looking forward to seeing it because of said reputation. It's mentioned in some jally books as one of these weird little oddities and like I say before Polanski's name's put against it and to me, you know, Polanski specifically of the 60s when you're looking at something like Rosemary's Baby or Repulsion um, you get excited or me, I get fucking excited because those are some of the, the, you know, the best in movies I can consider, you know, of craftsmanship, direction, uh, acting, like, weirdness, the, the way those movies make me feel, I instantly get wood for this movie. But, like I see, some of the narrative lets it down, and it's kind of handled in that way where the director himself has a good idea. It's like he's struggling, he's struggling in part to try and tie all the pieces up together. It's like a jigsaw that has unfortunately a couple of missing pieces that those pieces have been replaced with bits of other jigsaws and it'll never quite fit. It'll never make a complete picture. It's something that would be satisfying to sit down and build together. I think it does have some things for it that really elevate it overall though. Uh, the Nicola Piovani kind of score on this one which has elements of um almost kind of dreamlike music box sort of scoring works incredible in the movie. I think, you know, th those bits in the background add a bit of weight and a bit of class behind it. Really, really pack a punch in certain sequences or, or kind of on some level stand back and allow the movie itself to, to enjoy a bit more of... Um, a bit more of the, the the scapes that it builds, these these picture scapes with the sound in the background really elevate what you're seeing on the screen. Um, there are some bits with a, <laughs> um, a neighbour's cat. I do love cats in Italian movies because they're kind of wonderfully weird. There's a, hints towards things like voodooism um, in here, which and human sacrifices. And, and stuff like that, that kind of half pay off, half don't pay off, and this idea of, well, maybe, maybe um, there's something in the background here which is, is kind of allowing the explanation of the supernatural events. And it's never really fleshed out more than look at the stuff we're playing with, and it doesn't actually play with, with things in a certain way. It's interesting this movie predates something like The Tenant as well, because there are elements here that you would almost think Polanski had taken 
to use in the tenant, like there's certain moments here. I know the tenant's technically the third and concluding part of the the apartment trilogy, but that there are moments that are in there as well. I mean, it also owes, uh, in some respects, to the work that Mario Bava had built up on something like Kill Baby Kill, or even to an extent, um, the Whip in the Body. There are elements of of craft in there that kind of fit within it. Uh, it nods towards the kind of mystery unraveling the kind of dreamlike logic of even something like Aldo Lado's Short Night at Glass Dolls which came two years before there's a bit of that in there but what kind of what kind of ultimately lets the movie down is that you have to spend a long time with a movie that isn't necessarily caring about the the coherence of its its narrative. It isn't at all. It's kind of like, we love these ideas and we love these set pieces and we aren't really overly concerned if they, they pay off towards the end and they don't. Um, but you juxtapose that with incredible amounts of, of um, you know, set design and cinematography with a really great score and some great acting. I mean, you know... I like Mimsy Farmer in this movie. I think she plays the role of a woman who is kind of haunted, but at the same time weirdly infatuated with these hallucinations that she goes through. Um, I think that works really, really well. I think the movie overall has some issues, and those issues you can drive a, a fucking bus through, but it's not... You know, there isn't stuff that you can't hang your hat on here, and it sounds like I'm trying to defend a movie that isn't great. I mean, I would say if you're a Jalo completist, try and track this one down. I will say if you're trying to get into Jalo, this is... If we were having a scale of accessible Jalo to less accessible Jalo, this is definitely on the less accessible side. This one suffers from a lot of the tropes that I've seen used against the genre where people talk about specifically plots that don't go anywhere, um, you know, endings that don't make sense or style over substance. You can certainly lean into this one and say this movie has a lot more of that than some of the other ones that we've covered thus far within the genre. Um, I give it a three and a half out of five. I still liked a lot of what I saw. I still think there's a lot to be mined out of this one. And I did really like the idea of this, you know, th these repressed memories coming back and haunting her and the, way, and the way she interacts with them and then the reveals at the end, I think are great. There are some purely fucking hilarious, laughable out loud moments, including one where Mimsy Farmer herself is looking at her mother in a mirror. So she has this vision of her mum spraying perfume on herself and she turns around to see her boyfriend there and there's a good pregnant pause of about five seconds before she releases this ear-piercing scream which her boyfriend does not react to and walks forward and gives her a hug. Um, it's like, is this real? Is this happening? Is it not? Why are people not reacting in a way that I feel there should be? Um, there's also a scene in here where they use a bit of a seance which almost felt like it was wink wink nudge nudging towards um you know like the, the territory of a, a don't look now which i thought was kind of interesting but ultimately isn't paid off either really a lot of what's in here is really cool set pieces that don't pay off so i feel my 3.5 is probably justified and apt but that's it the perfume of the lady in black told you not a lot to say about this one there isn't a lot to hang your hat on um definitely for one that are looking to deep dive and find things that will challenge them on the Jalo scale, then this is one to, to hit into. Uh, but yeah, out with that, I don't know. I don't know. Surprisingly high body count, actually. There's uh, six or seven kills in this movie. Um, so yeah, the, the, there's that, which is weird for a movie like this. You probably shouldn't be getting that um, on, on this on this sort of level. But there we go.